Yeah. Good. So yeah. So uh, the most, uh, as I said earlier, the most interesting part in this paper is that we get to learn how this very big, you know, or very large language models are trained. And the model which is of the most interest to us is the 405 billion parameter, which took 54 days to train. It used 16,000 GPUs and was trained on 15.6 trillion tokens. Um, and uh, the uh, so this paper I have not annotated, and I, I have a physical copy in front of me in which I made my notes. So I'll try to cover uh, points uh, as I go. And if you have any question anywhere, you can just stop me and we can go from there. So yeah so to give you a brief introduction about llama 3 so one of the uh, interesting thing about llama 3 uh, models is that they don't really you know differ much when it comes to architecture uh, when from llama 2 models the authors are saying here that the more the most of the performance improvement actually comes from the way they create curated data this time so throughout the paper we'll be seeing a lot of synthetic uh, synthetic data being used and you know uh, special data sets being used to you know jack the performance on certain aspects like reasoning uh, reasoning capabilities and uh, able scoring abilities so the interesting aspect of this paper is how they are first generating data which helps them you know improve the model performance and how they are using data in their uh, pipeline processes to improve the performance on certain tasks. And uh, another interesting aspect that we'll discover later is the uh, the way they come up uh, with how much, how many tokens do they need for training. And uh, they come up with their own scaling laws, which are a bit different from the ones in the Chinchilla paper. And we'll get to uncover that also. So these are the set of models which have been released uh recently uh it's it was just released in the july of this year itself so there are uh, uh, 8 billion parameter model 70 billion parameter model and 405 billion parameter model and along with them they have their instruction uh, instruction pipe instruct uh, variants of this model so uh, and uh, uh, so uh, another interesting aspect that is discussed in this paper is basically the way they distributed the entire training training process uh, for these models. So they are using four different types of you know uh, parallelism methods, and which is very intriguing. And we will discuss um, yeah, we, we will discuss later. And uh, so the scaling laws that they came up with, they mostly are trying to, they use their smaller models to come up with those laws. And then basically uh, they use the uh, relationships that they came up with to find the right number of uh, right number of total tokens that would be needed to train their biggest model. And uh, talking about their performance. So, uh, Lama three set of models provide very uh, you know competitive performance on different benchmarks. Uh, the uh, we will be covering more about this in the results section, and uh, yeah, so let's talk about the uh, general overview, which discusses about the model pre-training and post-training. So. Uh, right now, the way these language models are trained is like first step is uh, model pre-training, where it's just uh, the model is given a whole lot of tokens that it's you know it's supposed to train on. So, for example, uh, the four uh, four zero five billion parameter model almost gets trained on fifteen point six trillion tokens. So the first phase of the model training is this model pre-training where uh, the model is just, you know, is getting, you know, get to see a lot of this data, uh, a lot of data. And the thing is, uh, they also mentioned this uh, later into the paper that they have around 3% of uh, memor memorization, memorization rate. So the idea is that when you pass 
uh, you know when you train these models these big uh, these big models on a huge uh, amount of tokens these models somehow start to understand the different patterns and the relationships between you know different concepts uh, in the world and this helps them understand the english language or you know all the languages that they are being trained on a lot better but just you know pre training these models on a whole lot of text is not enough another important aspect of this is post training and in post training there are um, three things that are involved first one is the reward model uh, they try to train their own reward model which allows them to do you know rejection sampling basically given an alternative in the annotations uh, so they uh, the authors use a lot of synthetic data right and they need uh, they need a you know sort of a guide which lets the which lets uh, the author you know which which lets being able to identify which is not the right answer or which is the more preferred answer so the first thing that is in, uh, involved in post training is like coming up with your own reward model after that uh, once you have these you know rejected uh, you know these approved samples of annotations and synthetic data then the model goes through an another another step of fine tuning which is called the supervised fine tuning now supervised fine tuning is different from pre training because in pre training there is um, yeah in pre training uh, there is a certain and a specific data mix so we'll cover the data mix uh, but, uh, in some time what is the data uh, percentage of data in which domain so in pre training everything goes but in supervised fine tuning step what's happening is that they're trying to uh, you know fine tune the model on very specific or uh, specific data mixes and once the model is trained on that after that uh, the uh, the model then goes through the final step of dpo which is direct preference optimization where the latest um, latest round of human annotations is then used to you know nudge the model in a direction of in the direction of being a helpful chatbot so that it's able to understand the flow of a multi turn dialogue system and what sort of uh, sort of a policy you can say that is good for the language model to act on and uh, those three are the uh, three most important things in the post training uh, phase of the model so yeah we'll cover this in much more detail uh, especially uh, post training part uh, we get a much more information in this paper and it allows us to see how you know how to nudge these very big models into you know be being helpful for us in many use cases another uh, aspect that is discussed in this paper is the multimodality uh, so later in the paper they are discussing about including or you know training the vision backbone together with the language backbone and yeah, adding these multimodality features in these uh, llms so yeah let's begin with the pre training phase uh, so the most uh, important thing that I found in this part of the paper was the amount of effort that actually went in creating the data for this thing. And uh, so um, it turns out that it's not the amount of data that the model goes through, it's the quality that also matters a lot. And so there have been the authors took a lot of efforts in this area. So the so first uh, in the web data that they got they first removed all the personal identifiable information uh, that is present uh, in the multiple websites and you know and they basically rejected those websites and all the domains that are known to contain adult content so that's like the first round of filtering that they did then for uh, their text extraction and cleaning, uh, cleaning they built a custom parser and uh, the idea behind this parser was that they want to remove boilerplate content and you know and keep as much as new content uh, that is available they try they want to remove as much as redundant information that is there in the in the in the website's data and uh, 
the uh, interesting thing is that for when it comes to you know mathematics and coding capabilities they basically have a separate pipeline to handle that kind of websites so html pages which contain mathematics and code content they are handling them in a totally different method and one interesting thing was that they find markdown is harmful to the performance of a model that is primarily trained on web data compared to plain text. So they removed all the markdown markers, which is sort of weird. But as it turns out, markdown was helpful, was not really helpful for the model performance. So once they were able to get you know all this data a lot of effort is then done on deduplication so they don't want the model to see the same information twice so first level of deduplication is you know url level deduplication so they will basically try to keep the most recent version of the page for each url and uh, the another interesting thing is a document level deduplication so they use the minhash algorithm to you know remove uh, almost or near duplicates of documents so this another removes uh, one more layer of uh, redundant or oh, sorry or copied content and uh, and then there was line level deduplication and they removed anything that appeared more than six times in a bucket of 30 million documents and uh, uh, but uh, uh, yeah so basically this thing helps them to remove you know uh, navigation menus cookie warnings and but uh, sometimes it also comes at the cost of removal of high quality text and after that another another layer of filtering in which now they are um, uh, they use uh, duplicated and gram coverage ratio to remove, uh, you know, remove lines which consist of repeated content such as logging or error message. Then they try to find, you know, different dirty word counting, and they try to remove uh, more adult websites this way. And then they come up with a token distribution for each uh, document and just remove any document, you know, which has a distribution different than their standard distribution that they have across their own data set so uh, this is just trying to uh, remove uh, remove any sort of bad uh, bad training data and then they go further ahead uh, now they are trying to when it comes they use model based quality filtering also so they used fast text to identify uh, the language which is being uh, which is present in the on the website and since uh, the new models are multilingual uh, the meta's fast text uh, library came in hand for language identification and uh, then they used roberta based classifiers uh, to judge the quality of the document and uh, for code and reasoning data they come they came up with an entirely separate pipeline uh, so the way they did was that they they uh, to identify you know web pages with a different distribution they came up uh, they identified you know web pages with a different distribution of tokens and they came up with a dist you know custom pipeline and used llama two classifiers to to classify for good quality content and the thing was that when it comes to mathematics and code data uh, the presence of high quality data is um, is very important so they had a separate pipeline just to do this and talking about multilingual data so since uh, uh, the llama 3 model is multilingual they are uh, you know uh, similar to their pro processing pipeline for english they do all these steps you know the many that are mentioned here for uh, websites in different languages and they come up with you know language specific heuristics and uh, that's how they build the uh, you know the multilingual data purpose that they have now uh, so as i said i mentioned earlier they train this model on a very specific data mix so it's not like uh, uh, if yeah so the data mix consists of you know 50% tokens correspond to general knowledge 25% of them is mathematical and reasoning tokens 17% is code tokens and 8% is uh, 
uh, multilingual tokens. So this is the uh, the data mix for the pre-training phase. And uh, talking about annealing data, so uh, the concept of annealing data will keep on coming uh, a lot in this paper. So the idea is that once the model goes through its main sort of uh, main sort of training, then they gra gradually decrease the learning rate over a course of time, and they try to show the model you know, and, and you know give the model a very high quality uh, data set. Uh, during the during its annealing phase, so the idea is that uh, the in the in it, in the last steps of the training process, the model gets to see you know very um, um, very important or you know very uh, basically any data which the authors want the model to perform well on. So here uh, you will see that uh, after pre-training, they upsample the token. From very specific domains to you know improve the performance of the model. So um, they also mentioned that annealing improved the performance of uh, Lama 38 model on GSM 8K and math validations. However, they don't they didn't see the same performance on the 405 billion parameter model. So yeah. Any questions till now? Okay. <clears throat> now, yeah. One question: Did they open source this data set? Probably not, right? No. <laughs> the, their data set is the like the golden thing, right? They're not going to release that because uh, when you uh, so this is just the data for the pre-training data, right? For the pre-training phase. Uh, we'll see a lot of emphasis on data throughout the paper. So in the post training phase, we will see, uh, you know, a lot about synthetic data that they used portal, and especially when it came to performance on specific domains like uh, code, there is again a lot of synthetic data being generated, and uh, so a lot of effort is actually gone in this paper and in the entire model just on the data part. So I don't, I'm not sure if they released it. At least I didn't come across it till now. Yeah. Yeah. So talking about uh, model architecture. Uh, so the model for the Llama three model is same as as the Llama and Llama two models. Um, this time they used uh, grouped query attention. So. Let me uh, let me show you what group query attention is. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, yeah. So, one modification that they had in this paper is that they used grouped query attention. Let me open this image and I go back. You can hit Control Plus to zoom into it. Command Plus on Mac. Uh, it's not working for me. Oh, it worked. So yeah, so uh, uh, so the authors mentioned that uh, they used the group query attention in this paper. So traditionally, what happens is that you know uh, in the standard uh, attention is all you need uh, transformer architecture. The number of heads that that are there for query and uh, for the query keys and values, they are all all same. Um, but I think sometime back there was the idea of uh, the multi query attention. So what happens is that you know you might have 10, 10 attention ten heads for the query values, but for k for the k for the k and v heads there is only one single head that is 
present and uh, surprisingly this thing then does not come with you know a very huge performance drop but as it turns out when this thing happens there is uh, a bottleneck uh, when it comes to not the the processing power of the algorithm but i think it causes an issue in the reading uh, reading of data at runtime. time so basically the evolution of multi query uh, attention head was the group query attention head so what happens here is let's say uh, instead of having one is to one ratio or n is to one ratio of query to uh, key, key value heads you might have a ratio of uh, let's say if you have eight eight query heads you will have four e head and value heads for that so what happens is that at runtime all these um, all these heads they will be uh, sort of uh, what is the term for that they will be extended or copied in such a way that the final count remains same so that the attention values are being calculated per token wise but uh, but uh, you know having this smaller number of kb heads actually comes in very handy when they later discuss about you know how did they distribute uh, how did they distribute uh, the training process across you know 16000 gpus so uh, what this uh, not only having you know smaller uh, smaller number of kb heads reduces the memory needed but it also allows the model you know to increase the increase the context length which the model is allowed to work with so even if you increase let's say the uh, allowed context length here was 4000 right when you increase the uh, increase the uh, context length to 8000 the memory required for that will not increase too much because the kb heads is, the number of kb heads is less so this helps in both later on which we'll discuss in uh, you know distributed training and also keeping the memory needed for the uh, model to run so yeah so they added the gqa uh, attention uh, group query attention in this paper and uh, and they are also using kv cache which is present in the llama 2 paper so kv cache also um, allows them to reduce the the memory requirement for that so so okay i'll i am not able to find the perfect image to explain kv cache but just to give an example uh in kv cache uh, so whenever uh, so the idea is that in the calculation of attention values there is a lot of repetition so every time uh, at least in the inference time what happens is that you are always calculating the attention values for all the all the tokens that came uh, before that specific token so the idea there is that why not uh, why not just you know retain the values that are useful for our present calculation and that sort of becomes a cache for the key values and a cache uh, uh, you know a key cache and a value cache and that uh, sort of reduces the memory requirement of the model and uh, apart from that uh, yeah so they are using uh, uh, rotary uh, rotary positional embeddings and uh, another interesting thing about their architecture is that they use swiglu swiglu as an activation function yeah it's mentioned here so uh, you can see here that because of the group query attention the number of attention heads that they might have 32 but the key value head number is less than 32 so it's uh, eight key value heads per layer and uh, talking about their vocabulary size so interesting thing was that they took their uh, vocabulary from the tick token library and on top of the also the tick token library has 100k tokens and and to add you know multilingual capabilities to llama models they added 20k additional tokens on no, uh, 20k additional tokens to support uh, non english languages so um, yeah so they basically built upon the tick token library and added more tokens just to support you know non-english language 
and uh, yeah so the entire architecture you know has 126 layers and the internal model dimension is 16384 and uh, if uh, so there are you know certain things which are interesting about the llama 2 architecture i think we might have discussed in the earlier um, uh, one of the earlier meetings but uh, but okay we don't need, we don't have to discuss them right now so yeah talking about the one of the really most interesting findings of this paper uh, the scaling laws the you know the kind of uh, results that they came up with to identify how many um, you know how many um, how much tokens are needed for you know a, a model of particular uh, particular parameter size so uh, so their key findings is that you know the existing scaling scaling laws typically predict only predict only next token prediction loss rather than specific benchmark performance and uh, so they are trying to uh, the existing laws are more focused about uh, you know they are trying to gauge the model loss model loss as a parameter to identify whether these number of parameters are right for this amount of data or not and uh, i am forgetting the findings of the chinchilla law paper like what is the relation there between the data that is needed for the model size i can't remember that right now and uh, so uh first thing that they did different here is like they try to establish a correlation between the compute optimal models negative log likelihood on downstream tasks so they are not looking at the at the you know the loss of uh, the loss during the training time as a metric to identify the compute optimal uh, size of a model and uh, they, then they next try to correlate you know that this negative log likelihood with the task accuracy so this kind of lets them see okay if we keep this these many models and we use this many tokens how what sort of accuracy can we anticipate on this particular task later on and uh, yeah um, Mm, yeah. so these two figures are quite interesting so each of these curves they sort of show you know with the same uh, the same fixed compute if they increase or decrease the uh, decrease the training tokens that is given to the model and how that changes the performance or the validation loss for that particular model so as it turns out that uh, it's not a you know linear relation so for the same amount of compute if you end up giving much more token uh, tokens than the model which is compute optimal you might end up actually decrease the performance of the model so it's not like a linear relation which uh, in which you just keep on feeding data and the model will just keep on improving forever and uh, so uh, and this uh, um, uh, I forgot what this graph was about, but yeah, so this is the final relationship that they came up with. And, uh, based on this, uh, based on this, uh, relationship, they were, uh, they suggested that, uh, you know, a, a model of 402 billion parameter would require around 16.5 trillion tokens. And uh, the final figure that they ended up using was for a 405 billion parameter. They used uh, 15.6 trillion tokens. So uh, basically, uh, they they also suggest that you know the performance of uh, performance of this model is relatively robust to small changes in the model size and training tokens because if you see uh, this graph here, it's sort of like flat around their minima so it's uh, it's not like you know very specific amount of tokens that 
needs to be there so it, if you are somewhere in that range the model will perform well uh, even with some you know slight increase in the training tokens or decrease and uh, um, yeah so they linear they uh, we uh, the authors linearly correlate the negative log likelihood of correct answer in benchmark and the training flops and uh, Later on, they establish a sigmoid relation between the log likelihood and the accuracy using the both uh, using both the scaling laws here and their own you know observations on the Lama two models, and this basically allows them to be very you know accurate or be you know in the ballpark area of how much performance can they expect from the four hundred and five billion parameter model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think um, this heading will be the last one that we cover for today because this is a big one, and we'll be discussing the um, the distributed process or everything that they did here for you know for them to be able to train such a huge model. So yeah. Yeah. So they trained the Llama 3 405 billion uh, model on 16,000 H100 GPUs, which is around 1.2 million GB of, <laughs> of GPU RAM. And uh, the entire training actually happens in half precision in uh, B float 16. So uh, for them to, uh, to do that, they need around uh, uh, yeah, they need around 1.5 million GB uh, uh, GPU RAM, and uh, yeah, so they have uh, to be able to do that. They the Meta uh, came up with their own global scale training scheduler. They have their own their their own general purpose distributed file system, and uh, they are also. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of very meta uh, uh, meta specific uh, things that they developed here. Uh, interesting thing is when it comes to storage, there you know whatever system that they use uh, has a major challenge that it has to be able to support you know the highly bursty checkpoint writes that saturate the storage fabric for a short durations. Because when it comes to saving the checkpoint values, suddenly all the GPUs will start, will try to save their state at the same time, and which is a very big issue uh, while coming up with a storage uh, for a storage system for this. Another uh, aspect of this, like how do you how do you you know uh, align this these many GPUs on a network? So. Um, um so they used um uh, i am not sure what exactly this is uh rose fabric and um arista 7 800 mini pack open compute project but uh basically uh you know their clusters comprise or their entire cluster comprises of 24k gpus out of which uh they use only 16 they only 16k gpus and uh, each rack uh, has 16 GPUs and uh, um, uh, 16 GPUs between two servers and they are connected by a single mini pack top of the rack switch and uh, and they have a total of 192 such racks and uh, um, they have their own implementation for the load balancing of uh, of the data that will, that needs to be given uh, at training time and uh, um, yeah this is what i really wanted to discuss in this section so um the parallelism that actually goes on uh, for us for for them to be able to train this thing so they are basically using 4d parallelism and we will discuss each one of them um, in uh, soon uh, we'll discuss them soon and uh, so it combines tensor parallelism so tensor parallelism is like uh, something like what happens inside uh, fsdp where let's say within one layer 
Uh, so different weights within that layer will be put on different GPUs at the same time. And whenever the forward pass is supposed to happen, uh, there will be, uh, I think, uh, uh, not all gather um, an operation that is done. Uh, yeah. So at, at at during the forward pass, all the weights from all the GPUs will be collected together for the forward pass of that particular layer, and then this keeps on happening. So tensor parallelism here refers to you know distrib uh, keeping like distributing the same weight right on different GPUs at the same time. Then pipeline parallelism is nothing but model parallelism, basically uh, having different layers of the model on different GPUs altogether or different um, servers altogether. And uh, context parallelism is is when where let's say if you have a sequence length of four zero nine six, then you keep first half of it on one GPU and the second half of it on a second GPU, and when the attention when that tension calculation is supposed to happen over the entire sequence, then what you do is you gather the all the uh, all the KV heads on separate GPUs, and you gather them locally, and then you calculate the attention on that GPU for that particular uh, half of the context, and that way the attention is calculated uh, in different layers. And finally, the data parallelism, which basically means you know, just if having a very huge batch size, and then each GPU gets like some specific part of that batch size. So they are doing all of these four parallelism on in, on the 16k GPUs that they have, and um, so yeah. So tensor parallelism splits individual weight tensors into multiple chunks on different devices. Pipeline parallelism partitions the model vertically into stages by layers, so that different devices can process in parallel different stages of the full model pipeline. Context parallelism divides the input context into segments, and reducing the memory bottleneck for very long sequence length inputs. And uh, yeah, so data parallelism is uh, fairly straightforward. Um, interesting thing here is that uh, so they were able to use uh, you know uh, um, 38 to 43 percent was their efficiency of you know of efficiency of their cluster cluster usage uh, here also they are mentioning here so um, uh, I will come back to this figure when we discuss the parallel, uh, the body parallelism in much, much more detail. So here is an example of uh, how this parallelism works. So I don't have a drawing board with me right now, or else I would have shown it in a much better way. So um, you can think of. Uh, um, Okay, let's start with the. Uh, I'll try to create a mental image through words only. So let's start with tensor parallelism. Okay, uh, so uh, um, imagine one particular layer, and you try to uh, try to put a, a particular layer T, and then you try to distribute those weights on into two parts T zero and T one, and you have four GPUs in front of that, in front of you, okay. So uh, first GPU will have E0, uh, like the first half of the of the layer. Then uh, second GPU, uh, you can see here also, I think. Yeah, second GPU will have, uh, will have the second part of that particular layer. Then the third GPU will have the, uh, will have the first part again and the fourth GPU will have um, uh, four GPU will have the, uh, the first part again. And then uh, on these four GPUs, uh, then this part might have the first context. This, these, this, these two GPUs will have the first context, first half of the context, and these two will have the second half. And then in this di in this uh, vertical dimension, you can think of, you know, this was the first layer, right? Then there could be a second layer here and a third layer. And once you have this 3D structure, then uh, then comes the data data parallelism here. So 
this 3D structure will get a separate mini batch of the data and another 3D structure will get you know separate mini batch of the data. And uh, yeah, so these are the details of the amount of uh, you know tensor parallelism, context parallelism that happens for uh, for these uh, for the for so for, for for this model for 405 billion parameter model. So they uh, they iteratively increase the sequence length. So when they were training for the sequence length of 8192. They were passing the entire sequence in one go and each layer, the weights of each layer were being divided on eight separate GPUs and the entire, uh, entire, you know, 126 layers was being divided into 16 parts at each part and their batch size was, uh, uh, so they had 16 million tokens per batch and they, a local batch size of 64. So each uh, each group of this uh, this 3D, 3D parallel group was getting a batch size of 64. And uh, interestingly, when they scale up to the sequence length of uh, 131, uh, 131K, then they are dividing this, you know, this token length into 16 parts. And uh, each, the weights of each layer are being divided on 16 GPUs. And the entire model architecture vertically is being uh, divided into 16 parts. And uh, so you can see that when it comes to uh, very huge sequence length, that's where the uh, context parallelism comes in handy because now uh, instead of having one, uh, you know, one single GPU having the entire context at one go, uh, you divide it into 16 parts and the attention, when it comes to calculating the attention values, you will calculate them globally by doing, uh, uh, by uh, gathering all the KV values, all the KV heads that you have. But then this allows uh, the model to be, you know, to be distributed in its training, but being able to work with very long sequences at the same time. And the uh, um, interesting thing that they mentioned here was that uh, with all these, uh, uh, with all the optimization, they could pre-train Llama 3 on sequences of 8K tokens without any activation checkpoint. In. So, which is very interesting because uh, that basically shows that uh, even with, uh, even with, you know, um, even with dividing, uh, dividing their layers on each, um, on each uh, GPU, on, uh, dividing their each layer on eight different GPUs, they still don't need the activation checkpointing, which they would have needed for calculating the values in the forward and the backward go. So basically they were able to retain all the tensors um, and they didn't really need any activation checkpointing for that. And uh, so all these, all these parallelism methods, they basically enable them to train up to extremely long sequences of 128k and uh, yeah yeah so that uh, so just i want to go highlight one more thing here so tensor parallelism basically uh, needs all gather for all the weights context parallelism needs all gather for the KV heads only, and uh, pipeline. Um, so, uh, sorry, pipeline parallelism uh, needs uh, um, since in pipeline parallelism, separate parts of the model are on different systems altogether. They they need to have a very good communication between these two separate you know splits of the model. So, and uh, data parallelism basically. Uh, the amount, the communication that is needed for data parallelism is is only at the final step where the loss calculation is being done and the gradients have to be thrown back. So uh, because of this, uh, the tensors, uh, the GPUs which have tensor parallelism have to be very close to each other, possibly with an NB link, and uh, the, and the GPUs with context parallelism. 
they can still be on the same server at but they uh, the amount of communications that they need with each other is not that much so they can be on the same server rack. Pipeline, uh, uh, pipeline parallelism needs the model to be, you know, uh, nearby to each other in in net, in the in the space of the network, so that the latency between the communication, uh, latency of the communication between the splits of the model is not very high. And for data parallelism, it's it's uh, the only communication that they need is is in the final step at the loss calculation and the gradient. Uh, when they have to uh, start the backward flow. So for data parallelism, uh, very efficient and fast communication is not really a much priority. And the uh, uh, reason we are discussing about this is because this parallelism has to be network aware. So, uh, so the order of parallelism is uh, tensor parallelism, context parallelism, pipeline parallelism, and then uh, data parallelism uh, and this is the way they have optimized it for the network communication because uh, tensor parallelism needs that the that the gpus that have uh, that have a share of weights of a layer have should be very close to each other and should have very less latency and uh, um, so uh, talking about the efficiency of this entire operation so as we discussed here, um, um, uh, so yeah, uh, through careful tuning of the uh, parallelism configuration hardware and software, they achieve an overall BF16 uh, model flops utilization of 38 to 43 percent. Uh, which I'm not sure is is it a very good figure, but it definitely looks a bit underutilized. But uh, uh, that is the sort of efficiency that they were able to get through this configuration. And uh, talking about the uh, the the sort of failures that they were handling during the during the training procedure. So the idea is that when these all these 16,000 uh, GPUs are being trained in tandem. Even if one single GPU fails, right? It could be uh, there can be uh, a lot of reasons why that might that might happen. So uh, you might have some issue with the memory, or there might be some, uh, you know, um, uh, then there might be that for that particular GPU node, uh, there's an issue in being able to save the checkpoint. So the idea is that the system should be robust enough that they should be able to first identify as soon as possible if there is any fault with any GPU. Uh, that uh, so it becomes very important because then it basically just uh, just you know just stops the entire training process altogether. Secondly, whenever there is such an interruption, the uh, the entire architecture should be able to handle that. So there uh, there has to be dynamic resource allocation, and the the, the entire pipeline should be uh, you know fault tolerant enough for uh, for this thing to be uh, for the for the training to be sustainable. So in the fifty four day. Uh, period of pre-training, they uh, found 466 job interruption. Uh, most of them were basically uh, planned interruptions due to automated maintenance, such as firmware upgrades or operator-initiated operations. Uh, 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 yeah. The remaining uh, 419 were unexpected interruptions in which 78% uh, uh, were because of you know hardware issue. And uh, um, there was one interesting thing here. Uh, so they mentioned somewhere, I'm not able to find. So they had basically a 90% effective training time, even with all these interruptions, right? So uh, they were able to change the SSDs on these systems while they were in training. And uh, so, uh, Talking about efficiency, so here we saw that they had 38% uh, flops efficiency and flops utilization, and they had 
around 90% effective training time while supporting all this automated cluster maintenance, including um, the firmware and uh, Linux kernel upgrades. So, and uh, they basically did a lot of custom work here. They uh, they built, uh, you know, uh, they uh, upgraded the NCC LX library for them to, you know, uh, detect if there is any fault with the any GPUs. One issue that they highlight is the problem with slow GPUs. So, um, uh, so it's very hard to identify, you know, when the GPU is uh, has become slow in its operation and uh, they basically come up with their own uh, uh, version and the uh, ncc lx library uh, to be able to identify them and uh, yeah so this is where i will stop for today so till now we broadly discussed about the you know data mix that is used for the pre-training of the data the model architecture we just we took a very bird's eye view of the model architecture and the sort of parallelism that they used for you know training you know such a big model on 16,000 k gpus uh in the next meeting we will be covering much more about uh, the their uh, uh, the training process and uh, later we'll go into the post training part which is i think the most fascinating part of how they are converting these huge pretend models into something useful for humans at a later stage so uh, this is it from my side today any questions cool thanks so much akash that was great um yeah if you need any help for the rest of the paper let me know can go to the chat yeah, actually, I've almost finished the paper. Um, but, nice. Uh, yeah. Um, cool, then. Catch you guys soon. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a very fascinating paper, Ahmad, if you get time to... Uh, there's, like, a lot of, you know, good nuggets in this paper, and... And uh, after we cover this paper, I think we'll cover the new GPT-01 paper system card. It, I, that seems quite interesting. And yeah, once we have covered the uh, the existing state of the art, then we'll jump to the newest GPT-4. So you know, GPT-01 models. And with O, the O1 model published a paper. They didn't, uh, they just basically published their system card, which is basically their safety evaluations of the model, where they're trying to discuss how much of an autonomy you can expect from them. So it's more like reading on the safety findings that they did. It's not a more, it's a, it's not a discussion on the model architecture. However, there are a lot of speculations on that, which we can discuss uh, sometime in the future, but sure. they, their safety, at least their safety findings they have shared because uh, it doesn't, they, they are saying that it's a model that reasons and things, but at the same time, if they're saying that they should release, you know, the safety findings that they had. Mm -hmm. uh, GPT-401, uh, uh, I'm assuming uh, you mean G instead of GPT-4 UI, you are saying GPT-01. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, day before yesterday, I'm not sure which day. I think it's not. Uh, I think on Friday, Friday or Thursday, they released this uh, new model. And the idea behind that model is that it is able to reason and think about its actions. And uh, the way I uh, so the idea is that this model is. Um, able to you know take much more time to come up with uh, with a particular solution and it's trying to uh it's trying to basically uh, reason 
in a much more deliberate way like um, like we think and uh, i tried it for my own project so i was stuck with a particular code and uh, i tried gpt4 o and 4 o mini and uh, clods on it also for that but they were not giving me that much good result for that but uh, it was able to give me a good result because it was able to understand you know the bigger context in a much better way but as as the chat kept on increasing as the context length for that model kept on increasing the performance i found that the performance kind of got worse with time but uh, i think with a smaller context it's definitely doing much better uh, you know reasoning or being able to give correct answers for that and uh, yeah so there are a lot of speculations of what is happening but it seems like they have cracked something like an alpha go for language generation so basically i think they are using um, they are just uh, training uh, they're training uh, uh, a language model not as a language model but it's a reinforcement learning policy where the model is just uh, i think through over time through you know some sort of um, guided direction they are letting the more the model is just trying to answer different things and if it is able to correctly answer something then it is getting a reward from there i think some sort of a, they would have built some specific uh, some very specific reward model for this and basically by instead of just trying to output a token uh, step by step i think it's the model is trying to learn a policy over how to solve questions so that's uh, a lot of buzz that's the buzz sort of around the gpt new gpt model that's out there <clears throat> they have they have a basic blog post, but yeah, that as you said, that doesn't actually talk about uh, anything about the methodology. Just why they yeah. can't, yeah, hide the chain of thought and um, some just a lot of eval results. But yeah, if you want, you can chat about that. Cool, cool, cool. Right, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Bye. See you next week. Bye.